Hello, I'm Mary Miller. I'm coming to you from the Exploratorium. We're really excited today because we're going to connect live with the EV Nautilus, which is just off the coast of California, off of San, near San Francisco, where we are now. And we're going to be talking with Emily from the Inner Space Center, and she's going to connect us to the Nautilus. Emily, are you there? Hello, Mary. Yes, I'm here. Welcome to Nautilus Live. My name is Emily. I'm coming to you from the Inner Space Center. How is everyone doing today? We're, we're doing great. We're really excited to uh, connect with the ship today, Emily. Absolutely. Well, we're excited to be here. And before we get started, I'd love to hear what your audience looks like today. We have a really good audience today. We probably have about 50 people in the observatory right now, and um, a lot of people here just waiting to connect with the ship. Wonderful. Well, on that note, I'd love to introduce to you uh, our members of the Corps of Exploration. And we have two members. We have Jan and Kelly, and they're going to be answering all of your questions today. So enjoy. Thank you. Hi, hi Jan, and good to see you. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about where the ship is now and what is going on on the Nautilus? Hi, Mary. Hi, Exploratorium. Uh, yes, we're uh, traveling south, uh, let's see, off the Sonoma County coast, I think, right now. And we are going towards the Ituna. And the Ituna was originally built in Scotland in 1986 as a yacht. And it was later converted to a fishing trawler. And on its maiden voyage uh, to start its work as a trawler, it actually hit high seas just outside of Drake's Bay, and it sank. Um, 14 crew members were on board, and four, 12 of them were rescued. And that was back in 1920. Uh, we were able to take a look at the shipwreck uh, using uh, a much lower resolution ROV several years ago. Uh, but thanks to Nautilus and thanks to Ocean Exploration and Research, our sister agency within NOAA that Kelly represents here, uh, we were able to map the uh, shipwreck in much finer detail. And so we're going to, we had some extra time, and so we were going to be able to dive on it this afternoon, probably close to 7 p.m., give or take an hour or so. So, Jan, you've been exploring, or, or the, this mission uh, has been exploring the Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, um, transiting through some of the richest eco marine ecosystems on Earth. If we were to take a ship out there like you are to the Farallons, what would we be seeing? Unless you go under the ocean, you're really just going to see the, the, the surface. And so this ship is really equipped to do many different uh, research and exploration disciplines like mapping. mapping. And um, so when you're at the surface, you're seeing seabirds and marine mammals. We have one of the richest areas for seabirds and marine mammals in the world. Uh, that's one of the main reasons why at the time it was, it was uh, Point Reyes, Farallon Islands National Marine Sanctuary back in 1981. We later changed our name to Gulf of the Farallons National Marine Sanctuary to represent the body of water that we protected. And just last year, our name changed as our sanctuary expanded. And uh, now we're called Greater Farallons National Marine Sanctuary. But this is one of the richest uh, seabird and marine mammal areas of the world. And it's just been within the last few years when technology has really come around. Uh, the opportunities within sister NOAA agencies have uh, brought to us the ability to explore what's under the water. So these deep sea canyons and fault uh, scrapes and escarpments, like the Farallon escarpment that we were diving on late last night, that was almost, if not more than a mile deep. And looking at the benthic creatures, uh, the sea uh, sponges and uh, the corals, uh, the fish, rich in life. 
And this expedition is really representing a wonderful partnership opportunity um, as the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research supports efforts to mm -hmm. map and to document for the first time deep sea habitats and shipwrecks, um, helping to satisfy both our exploration mission to reduce the largely more than 95% unknown ocean while also supporting sanctuary managers to get the critical baseline information that they need to inventory the resources within their um, sanctuary so they can manage them more effectively. Yes, yes. Mapping is so important. If, uh, if we run into high seas while we're at sea here, uh, we can still do mapping. You know, we can't safely mm -hmm. deploy things over the side or over the back of the boat, so we want to protect not only the uh, equipment, but also the personnel handling the equipment. So in certain sea conditions, uh, rougher seas, but we can still collect a lot of research. Um, the bottom to topography in this area is really important to um, our entire ecosystem. Uh, Greater Fairlawns was expanded uh, last year in order to really protect the entire upwelling cell that we have uh, in this region. And this is one of four upwelling regions within the world uh, that is this rich in uh, diversity and productivity. And when I say productivity, I mean from the little phytoplankton plant as well as zooplankton animals that basically are the food chain, the base of the food chain for the rest of the organisms like whales and seabirds and salmon. So in the Point Arena area, that upwelling cell really begins and starts generating. And we have an upwelling season. We have three oceanographic seasons in our area, south, east, got to get my directions straight, and then because of the Coriolis effect of the earth, that w surface water is then pushed offshore, and that then is the bottom water upwelling, and with that upwelled water comes all of those wonderful nutrients, they hit the sunlight, and then everything starts growing. So the water that's at Point Arena um, really just starts maturing and producing uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton that eventually in about seven to ten days uh, reaches the Gulf of the Farallons region. But first it has to pass uh, Bodega Canyon where if you go down a slope and then you come up, uh, the water then creates just naturally uh, a vertical circulate, uh, circulation. Hits uh, the uh, Rittenberg Bank, the Farallon Islands, Point Ray, so all of that bottom topography is really important and it's important for us to know where those features are. This is the place to be because we have deep canyons, we have uh, banks, we have uh, features that uh, jut out into the ocean and all of that creates uh, a circulation, a change in the circulation pattern uh, locally and so this is Um, this is a destination feeding ground. I know that uh, we have uh, albatross from Hawaii flying all the way over here just to feed and to bring food back to their chicks on the nest all the way back to Hawaii. So again, uh, we have humpback whales, blue whales, fin whales. Um, we were seeing a lot of whales this trip. Uh, a break from being inside the RV, uh, ROV van. So Jan, you, you mentioned that part of the recipe for our rich uh, productivity is, is the fact that we have these steep canyons which allow this very cold, very nutrient-rich water to come to the surface where it just nourishes a whole ecosystem. Uh, can you tell us, is there also a connection from the surface waters back to the deep sea? Are the Habitats different there, or, or is there also a lot of diversity and productivity that you've been seeing in the deep sea as a result of upwelling? Um, well, this is uh, one of the uh, first few looks at the deep, deeper portions of the sanctuary. So we're just really now just exploring and um, doing a little bit of characterization, uh, kind of getting our bearings as far as really future uh, investigations. 
but um, I mean, you get life at the surface that really depends on sunlight. Uh, as you go down in the water column, you get into the twilight zone, and uh, then you have basically no light. So most of the creatures that we've been looking at this week, the corals, the sponges, the fish, uh, the, all of the other invertebrates uh, living on the rocks, and the, they are not light dependent at all. And they feed and behave differently than those surface creatures. Um, you have corals in the tropics that really depend on uh, a symbiotic relationship with um, algae. Is it algae that lives in the corals? Yes. yes. Yeah, zoxanthellae. That's easier <laughs> for you to say um, in those tropics. But the corals that are in the deep the oceans, uh, they don't rely on light at all. They have their own feeding mechanisms. Their polyps uh, are, uh, are out in the water column almost all the time feeding, and so they feed all by themselves. Uh, so, uh, Jan, the National Marine Sanctuary is a system um, for protecting coastal regions. What kinds of uh, stressors or what kinds of threats are there to... Uh, to the wildlife and the ecosystem, and, and what can we do to help um, support and protect those ecosystems? Okay. Well, this, uh, the National Marine Sanctuary pro Program is part of uh, NOAA, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And we work with our sister agencies within NOAA to identify areas that um, which protect. Uh, also, um, organisms like whales, dolphins, porpoises, fish, invertebrates, corals, and sponges. And so we work with our sister agencies in order to identify and map those areas, locate them. So you can't protect anything if you don't know it's there. Uh, and then we work with agencies to make certain that we have sustainable fisheries. So, uh, for instance, if bottom trawling, a net uh, or a, uh, yeah, a net or a cage, uh, a crab pot, for instance, uh, lands on top of a coral, it's going to crush it. And so once we identify these areas where corals and sponges, uh, which are rich in life, um, can help uh, bring along in our protection, uh, basically a part Protection, I mean, um, say, for instance, you have to have walls around you to keep warm, survive. You have to have food. You have to have water. Um, that's what I mean by an apartment building for all of the invertebrates that live in a coral colony. And so these coral colonies are very important to sustaining and, and housing and being able to attract prey as well as uh, be prey for many of the uh, invertebrates and fish down there. And the sanctuary program uh, really works to protect those habitats and make certain that we have sustainable fisheries, that we know where we can safely harvest fish and invertebrates like Dungeness crab that I love, um, and areas that really need to be protected, like shipwrecks, like the Ituna. For a shipwreck, uh, the, the fishermen certainly don't want to do that. Um, the maritime uh, archaeologists certainly don't want us to do that in the sanctuary program and National Marine Fisheries Service in NOAA. So being able to identify where these shipwrecks are uh, being able to identify where these uh, sensitive uh, coral habitats are really goes a long way to um, sustaining healthy oceans. Uh, Kelly, I have a question for you. I know that the Nautilus is one of two ships of exploration that has very unique capabilities, and we're actually talking to you right now through one of the, those called telepresence. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Absolutely. So telepresence, as we like to say, is really the ability to um, remotely engage others in an experience live while they're located in a different location. 
Um, and the way that telepresence works is that we have a number of cameras located here in different places around the ship. Um, and then, of course, high-definition cameras on the remotely operated vehicles. Those live video feeds go to shore where scientists, students, the general public can watch and join the operation in real time with us. Um, what we're seeing in real time and make discoveries uh, as if they're sitting in the front seat of the control van as it's occurring. And what does this telepresence allow you to do that ships before now uh, couldn't do? What, do? what does Nautilus and Okeanos do that we can't do normally? So it's an exploration ship. We're going to areas that we haven't been to before, and we don't know what we might find. And that means that we can't always plan to have the right expertise on board the ship. So through telepresence, we're able to remotely engage um, additional science expertise on shore. For the last week, because um, we were able to watch at home uh, and here at the Exploratorium during a webcast we did last Tuesday, Exploration the Shipwreck USS Independence, um, which was a, just a, a, a spectacular and interesting uh, exploration that people probably from all over the world joined live. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about, about the independence and, and the dives on shipwrecks that have been made now in this expedition? Sure. Well, I'll start with the USS Independence. Um, I'm actually on board because I did my master's thesis on the Independence and then yes. <laughs> pass it to Jan to talk about some of the other wreck sites. So Independence was the first of um, a class of, they're called light fleet carriers or light aircraft carriers. Um, and she was built in response to a wartime emergency. Basically, as the US was entering World War II, um, after the attack at Pearl Harbor, uh, we didn't have enough air power. Um, the large Essex class of carriers were trying to be quickly built, but they weren't going to be built fast enough. So the Independence actually started her life as uh, she was being built as a Cleveland class flat, fast cruiser, the Amsterdam. And halfway through being built, I think her hull was about 40% um, constructed, uh, she was ordered to be converted instead to a light cruiser cruiser or a light carrier. So she had the speed of a cruiser, but the capability of an aircraft carrier. And even though she didn't represent the most advanced um, aircraft carrier, uh, ultimately nine of these carriers were built and really did serve to increase uh, our air power in the Pacific, which really did help turn the tide um, of the U.S. taking power uh, uh, or leave um, World War II. So her life started... Uh, initially just as a fleet aircraft carrier operating in World War II. And then actually after she was decommissioned, she has a rich and varied history. Um, she became part of the fleet to uh, initially bring back World War II veterans from, or World War II uh, combat personnel home. So there were over a million eight hundred thousand that were located all over wow. the world, World War II. We needed to bring them home. So she was converted to bring them home. And then actually became um, one of a whole collection of vessels um, that was used for the atomic bomb test offshore at Bikini Atoll. So uh, the United States wanted to understand the, the impact of these blasts on other vessels so we could plan uh, more effectively how to deal with that sort of situation in the future. Um, and then after that, she was brought back to Hunter's Point where she was used as the uh, pioneer platform for learning and teaching others how to try and conduct radiological decontamination. Uh, and then after that use was towed offshore of California uh, and intentionally scuttled. And she had not been uh, documented or visually explored um, since that day until this week. Thank you well, so Mary, Thank you so much. And I know Mary, you need I to go. We're uh, almost at the end. Thank you so much, Jan. I think you probably need to take us back to the Inner Space Center. Okay, back to you, Emily. Thank you. Bye, Exploratorium. Bye, Exploratorium, thank you. thank you so much for joining us today. Exploratorium, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Inner Space Center, the audience here at the Exploratorium and on the web. Um, this is uh, signing off for the Exploratorium.
partners um, that helped bring this uh, program to us today, the McBean Family Foundation, the Ocean Exploration Trust, NOAA, and the Oak Meadow Foundation. Thank you very much.